Good morning. It's uh, great to be with you again as we come together on this, the Lord's Day, to worship. Let's just open with a word of prayer. Father, as we come together, we thank you for your presence with us. Although we are separated by distance, Lord, we are one in this local assembly in the body of Christ. And Father, we thank you that by your spirit who indwells us that we can be together and we can be united in worship. So, Father, be with us this morning. Encourage our hearts, and may you be glorified. For we ask these mercies in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I was watching a little bit of late-night TV the other night, and there was a, a guest, I don't know, I think it was a guest, or one of the people on, was saying that he felt so guilty about lack of exercise that he put his Fitbit on his dog. <laughs> the dog was running around the house, so it was was clocking up some steps or kilometers or miles or whatever. And I thought of Joseph. I've entitled the sermon this morning, He Was a Man on the Move, as we look at chapter uh, 37. And uh, anyway, um, for Joseph, it was a little bit a different picture. Um, we pick up our story this morning in Genesis 37, 12, where Joseph is sent down to Shechem by his father Jacob to check on his brothers who have his father's flocks there and the grazing. It was a, a, a plain area, a flat plateau, an area rich in pasture. Uh, maybe not the safest place to be in light of the massacre of the men and people of Shechem and what uh, the brothers did to them. But they had probably been gone for quite a period of time, and his father was getting concerned and wondering what was going on. So down he sends Joseph. So he goes to Shechem about a three to four day walk and finds they've moved to a place called Dothan, about 20 miles away. And uh, so he goes to uh, check out what's going on there and finds his brothers. Uh, they see Joseph coming with his coat on. Uh, he must have stood out, <laughs> that's for sure. And bingo, they say, here comes the dreamer. Let's kill him and throw him into a cistern. The cistern is just a, an empty well. That's all it is, and uh, and we will say a wild animal killed him. Well, Reuben, the oldest, um, sees this and says, hey, hey, guys, just wait a minute. Let's hold on. Let's just throw him in the cistern. And he was hoping to come back at a later time and, and rescue him. Uh, I don't know what happened, but Reuben takes off. He maybe has some chores to do. Something uh, distracts him. Um, anyway, but he's not there. We don't know about Reuben. Was he was he a guy that uh, had good intentions, kind of a, a a change in his his character, his perspective, or was he a guy that just feared his father more because he'd already messed up in in big ways and didn't want more, uh, maybe more wrath or or to be on the outs with his dad? We we really don't know. But uh, again, we'll look at this in a minute. The 50 20 principle, you know, they meant it for evil, God meant it for good. We'll see how that unfolds in just a minute here. So they take off his robe and throw him into the pit. I think people, some people think if they haven't read on a little bit further that, you know, Joseph was just, uh, just this tranquil type guy that just said, oh, okay, fine. But no, when you read in Genesis 42 21, his brothers are talking. They said to one another, Surely we are being punished because of our brother. We saw how distressed he was when he pleaded with us for his life. Pleaded with us for his life. But we would not listen. That's why this distress has come on us. Hey, the guy was freaking out, as we all would, I guess. The background of Joseph screaming, and again, it, it puts more of things in perspective here. Here's the guy screaming in this cistern, save me, don't do this. Hey, guys, come on, you know. And they sit down and have lunch. <laughs> Unbelievable. It just shows how callous their hearts were. Well, a little while later, they saw a caravan of Ishmaelites coming along, and Judah says, well, hey, here's another idea, guys. Let's sell him to these guys and make some money. So they sold um, Joseph to this caravan. They got 20 shekels of silver, which was a, a normal price for 
uh, a mature male slave in those days, and uh, away he goes to Egypt. So Reuben returns. As we said, we, we don't know why he kind of split the scene for a minute, but he comes back and he rips his clothes. It was a way of mourning. He was really upset. He said, where can I turn now? In other words, what in the world am I going to do? What am I going to tell our father? So they take his coat, kill a young kid, a goat, dip his coat in blood, and take it back to their father and tell him a wild animal killed him. Bingo, deja vu. When Jacob got his uh, arm and neck covered by his mother with goat skin to fool Isaac so he could take his brother, uh, brother's uh, birthright, and he wanted to fool his father into giving him the blessing. So Jacob is now fooled. Jacob is devastated and broken and says he's going to grieve until he goes to the grave the rest of his life. So Joseph ends up in Egypt in the home of a guy by the name of Potiphar, who is called captain of Pharaoh's guard. And that's the basic outline. So we have a guy traveling from Canaan to Shechem to Dothan to Egypt. Just think about the changes in his life, in his life, in a matter of probably a few days to a week or maybe two weeks. Just incredible. Just incredible, the transitions that take place. And remember, Joseph was a guy who probably lacked humility, uh, some good people skills, but he didn't choose, okay? He didn't choose to be his father's favorite. He didn't jockey for a coat. He didn't ask to be put in charge. He'd done nothing, nothing to deserve such brutal, brutal treatment. He was basically a, a very ethical and upright follower of Yahweh, of Jehovah. But here he is, sold by his very own brothers into slavery. And I'm sure he believes at this point, I'll never see my father again. And he was probably very, very concerned, not only about that, but about the well-being of his father. But... But, here's the big but. Let's look at things from God's perspective. And in all things, all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who are called according to his purpose. They meant it for evil. God meant it for good. We read through the story and we get the narrative, we get the storyline, and, and that, that's great. But in these events, as we explore a little deeper, a little further, we see so much more going on in God's mind. It's remarkable. Well, let's take the first move from Shechem to Dothan. So the brothers needed to move their sheep to Better pasture probably was the reason. They'd been grazing there for a while. Let's move them to better pasture. Yeah, well, but in doing so, they moved right into the middle of a, an area that was very key for caravans to go through. And thus it creates the option. They now have the option of selling Joseph into slavery and getting him to Egypt where God wants him. Maybe without the caravan, probably they just would have killed him. It certainly looks that way in chapter 37, 18 and 19. They said, well, let's let's kill him. Let's, let's do away with him. We see in the incredible behavior of these brothers, uh, something that uh, is not too admirable. Yet, think about it for a minute. Yet without it, Joseph stays in Hebron. He stays in Canaan with his father and his flocks. What happens down the road when there is a drastic famine and no Joseph to have been managing the resources for years in Egypt? What happens? <laughs> They're in trouble. Why Egypt? Why Egypt of all places? 
For one, it was a culture that was both agricultural along the rich Nile Valley or, or on the shores of the Nile River. And Joseph was experienced in and gifted in agricultural things. He was a shepherd for one. He understood rural things. He understood agricultural things. And it was a society that was very unique. It was extremely um, inundated with administration. They loved administration, which Joseph excelled at. Coincidence? No, uh, I don't think so. We do not know for sure what date Joseph entered Egypt. It could have been during the reign, and I think it was of the Hykos rulers who reigned there for almost 150 years. Now, these people were unique. They were not native Egyptians, but they were actually Canaanites who had conquered Egypt. Hence, think about it, hence it would make a real sense that a foreigner like Joseph, who was a non-Egyptian, would fit in, would be accepted, and be more likely to be promoted. Again, as we read in the book of Galatians, when it talked about the time of Christ's birth and when the time had fully come, here was the opportune time for this guy to move into that culture and that setting. Joseph goes to Potiphar's house the captain of the guard, or a guy who was a high-ranking official in Pharaoh's bureaucracy. Again, remember all the administrative guys, all the positions. Joseph would have had an opportunity to see and get to know, to rub shoulders with a lot, a lot of important people. He also would have had a lot of important people taking note of what was going on as he managed, as we'll see next week, as he managed Potiphar's business, what he was able to accomplish. There would have been a lot of people in important positions that would have taken note of that. Perfect setting to eventually move Joseph up in government. Again, coincidence? No, I don't think so. And the Egyptians were a highly highly religious people, over 2,000 gods. Pharaoh was worshipped as a god. So when Joseph would have spoken about his, his, his god, his relationship with Yahweh, with God, they would have paid close attention. He wouldn't have been shunned. He would have had a very, very receptive audience. And we'll talk about more next week in the days to come. But, but see, you get the drift. God's providence, him moving these events for his glory, was everywhere. And I'm just doing the tip of the iceberg, believe me. I could say a whole lot more. But it was everywhere as we read through this narrative and see what was going on. A little boy I read the other day told his mother he saw a bear in the backyard. His mother looked outside and said, that's not a bear, it's Joe Smith's dog. Now go to your room and think about what you have done and ask God to forgive you. So he did, came down a short while later. His mother said, did you ask God to forgive you? The little boy said, yes, and it's all right. He said the first time he saw Joe Smith's dog, he thought it was a bear too. <laughs> oh, how we see it. How does God see it? Perspective. Perspective, my friends, is everything. So let's look at a perspective here as we sum this up this morning. How does this encourage us? And again, there's so much I could do here, but I've got to limit it, uh, folks, this morning. We'll look at more encouraging things next week. And I think the beauty of us coming to... Uh, to your home through this avenue is that, uh, you know, like the average adult can take in about maybe 20% of what they hear and see. Okay, 20%. This gives us an advantage actually where you can play this back a time, another time, or maybe two, you know, to, to think about what's being said, uh, to ponder it, that type of thing. Uh, you know, sometimes we miss things, play it back a second time, you pick something up. So I think that's a big advantage. 
The main thing is hanging in at times. And sometimes it's not just hanging in, it's literally hanging on. It's perseverance. We tend to, as human beings, get discouraged and frustrated when things just don't seem to be working out from our perspective. But hey, folks, our human perspective is so, so limited. This isn't downplaying anything, but we just sometimes need to stop, take a deep breath, and think. We need to try as much as possible to see things from God's perspective and trust him. The key is trusting him as Joseph did as he works. I'm telling you, if you look back in Genesis 3, all the way through the Bible, Jesus' temptation, his Satan's big lie is you can't trust God. You can't trust him. My friends, don't listen. He is faithful. He can be nothing else. Look at Joseph's life. If we were to stop here, here's a guy being thrown in a pit. The end of the story, he's being sold into slavery. Well, what would we think? But it isn't. It isn't as we know the end of the story. This is not the end of the story. And as we read on, as we, we go uh, into more sermons, as we study Joseph's life, we will see God's handiwork is so evident, is so evident in his sovereignty working things out for good, working things out for good. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your way, acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. What, what is the writer saying here? He's saying, well, you just put your brain on a shelf and, you know, no. He's saying, use your brain, use your resources, use common sense. But above all, we have to look at things from God's perspective. What I'm talking about from a, a, what we would call a Christian world, world view. And that would infuse our thinking so that over and above in God's wisdom, it is the final source the final authority of what we do. That's what he's saying. Trust in the Lord and his wisdom as we put all these things together, but again, over and above, trust in him and he will direct your path. He'll keep you on the right path. Again, I, I think back to G. Campbell Morgan because I, I, I have to think as a pastor how devastating that would be to go in, here's your dream, you know, Joseph has his dreams, G. Campbell Morgan, the dream of, of, of becoming a preacher. Actually, uh, in the Morgan family, they had five sons, and they were all preachers. And with Mother's Day coming up next week, um, <laughs> they, they were asked one time, the boys, all five of the ministers, asked, who's the greatest preacher in your family? And they pointed to their mother and said, she is, because of the life she led. Incredible testimony. Remember that rejected by men, accepted in heaven. Rejected by men, accepted in heaven. God, again, as I've said over and over, has his hand on your life. Let him lead. Let him, if you're uh, involved in a difficult situation this morning or thinking maybe you failed, don't listen to that voice. Let Jesus, let God's word set the criteria for success. He, my friends, in your life and in my life, and praise God for this, is not finished writing our story. Do you hear me? He's not finished writing our stories. The bumper sticker, be patient with me, God is not finished yet. Joseph was determined. My friends, be determined this morning not to be destroyed. Listen to me, not to be destroyed by circumstances. Don't let circumstances run your life. Don't let them be the overriding factor. In whatever situations you find yourselves this morning, 
I want to encourage you to give God your very best. Give him your very best. It might not be the long-term solution in your life. It might be something temporary, the short-term solution. I don't know. But give him your best. What you do, do for the glory of God. 1 Corinthians 10, 33. I am sure, listen, (laughs) I am sure Joseph had his moments. I'm sure Joseph got discouraged. I'm sure he maybe even got depressed. He wrestled with things, but, but he was determined in the valleys of life. You've got to make up your mind in the valleys of life to walk with God. It's an attitude. It's a mental decision. It's a decision of the will. You have to. As a follower of Christ, give your life and say, listen, Lord, I'm taking your hand and I'm going to walk with you through this valley. And there's some bad theology out there that will tell you otherwise, don't listen to it, that life is just a, 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 a picnic. It's a, it's a walk in the park. It's a, it's a breeze. It's all health and wealth and, and, and success. And well, I'd ask these people that preach this, to go read their Bibles again. I don't find that in an overriding theology in both the Old and New Testament. We've got to see the big picture here, and we've got to determine success according to God, not the world. That's the big thing. And forgive and forgive and forgive. Don't let hatred and bitterness spin its web around you. It burns up too much energy. It just burns up too much energy. Blurs your perspective. It makes little room for problem solving and creative solutions. It's also a real joy stealer. It zaps the energy. Listen, it zaps the energy out of life. Bitterness messes up your head and my head, and your heart and my heart. Forgive, forgive, forgive. Joseph couldn't get hung up on what had happened to him. There's a point where you've just got to let it go and get on. There's a bigger things involved here. You've got to be positive. You've got to move forward. What is forgiveness? Simply put, forgiveness is releasing. The most common word for forgiveness in the Greek in the New Testament is used in the context of releasing someone from a type of obligation, usually uh, most commonly a financial obligation. We read in, in Luke 7, 41 and 42, two men owed money, to a certain money lender. One owed him 500 denarii and the other 50. Neither of them had the money to pay him back, so he canceled the debts of both. Now which of them will love him more? And there's a picture of forgiveness. I like what Lewis B. Smead says in The Art of Forgiving. Listen. He says, when you forgive a person, that does not mean that you are immediately healed. We have a, some false conceptions of forgiveness. Now, I agree with Lewis. I think he's right on here. When you forgive a person, it does not mean you are immediately healed. It still stings. There's still some hurts. When you forgive a person, it does not, <clears throat> excuse me, this does not mean that you're going to be buddy buddy. You can forgive someone, you don't have to be. Uh, buddy buddies with them at all. When you forgive a person, this does not mean we surrender the right to restitution or justice when appropriate. And again, I put in brackets here in my in my own thinking as Christians, we must temper this with the word of God and especially with grace. When we really realize how gracious God has been to us in forgiving us as we'll celebrate in a few moments. And when we forgive a person, this does not mean that we trust them yet. 
We do not have to necessarily trust them at this point. They have to earn our trust. When we forgive a person, we are not avoiding pain. We're not avoiding pain. We're opening the door to healing. Now that potential is there. And when we forgive a person, we take the journey at a pace we are able to handle. It's different for everybody. And the deeper the hurt, the longer the journey. The longer the journey. Well, lots more to see next week with Joseph, a guy meeting his challenges, being wrongly accused and thrown into prison. We'll look at next week. My friends, I want you to remember this morning in this short reflection, short sermon, that the Lord is with you. His promise is, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. And he has his hand. He has his hand upon your life, just as he had his hand upon Joseph's. Isaiah the prophet, much of his writing is to tell people in exile to to, um, get through to them that even though the situation is this, we have a God that restores and God is with them. He says, do not fear for I am with you. It doesn't look like it now to the people Isaiah was talking to, but he says, So do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time we could spend together as we reflect in the small way on Joseph's life and the transition that takes place from his home into Egypt. And yet we see, Father, as we look at this story, we see you in the background moving the chess pieces around of his life, moving things into the position of your will so that good can be done, even though there was evil around. Father, I just pray that you would remind us this morning of your love for us, Father, as we gather around your table, that's part of the picture. A big part is that for God so loved the world, he gave his only son, and we celebrate that in a minute. But your great love for us and your presence with us and that you'll never leave us or forsake us. So, God, maybe there's one out there that's listening to you or listening to me this morning that needs a special word of encouragement. I just pray it would it would be there for them. You would speak to them. You would encourage them. You would strengthen them. And Father, again, we thank you for this time that we could meet for worship. And now, Father, as we assemble around your table, I pray your richest blessing. For we pray and ask these mercies in the wonderful, wonderful name. The name of Jesus. Amen. Well, you can get your little um, emblems out this morning, whatever cup you have, um, whatever you have to represent the bread or whatever. I've actually got a, a little cup of my my uh, juice here and, and a, a little cracker, actually, I thought was appropriate this morning. And um, hey, we're gathering around the Lord's table to remember his his body and his blood coming in the flesh and dying as a man on that cross to forgive our sins. So Father, we just thank you for this time that we can gather. And as um, Christians, we stop as we assemble this morning. Uh, We we just stop and, and gather in your presence. And as I've said this week in one of my reflections, we just stand Amaze in in Jesus, the Nazarene, and how he loved us, how he gave his life for us. We, we are just amazed, Father, and we say thank you. 
So we take a couple of moments this morning just to t stop and reflect, uh, to take the time. Maybe there's something that we just need to share with the Lord this morning that's on our hearts, that's heavy in our hearts. We take the time to confess some of those things that we've done that we know have been amiss, that have displeased the Lord. And remember, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And just to be in his presence. And remember, our brothers and sisters are in his presence too. Although we're not assembled this morning, we are united. We are united as we gather around his table. So let's take a moment this morning, just quietly bow as we reflect and commune with the Lord. Let's do that now. Amen. As we continue on in worship, we have the two emblems, and uh, they represent the, the, the body, the, the fact that Jesus came. He became flesh and blood like you and me. He, he lived, he taught, he healed. He showed us what God was like. In fact, the writer to the Hebrews says in these last days, if you read Hebrews chapter 1, actually we've been living in the last days since the time of Christ, according to the Bible. In these last days, he speaks to us through his son. The word coming, the living word coming through the written word. And so we take this emblem this morning. I've got a little cracker here that represents uh, probably more closely the bread in Jesus' day than the bread we use today. But it reminds us of what Jesus has done for us in the incarnation, in his life, in his death, and his resurrection, the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ. And that our bodies one day too will be resurrected and transformed. And we'll get the eternal body that we will have to live with him forever. So let's take a moment this morning and let's pray together. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your love for us. We thank you that you came in the flesh. Again, as I have said, to live before us, to show us what God was life like to perfectly fulfill the law, to die a brutal death, to show us what true love was all about. And Father, we just say thank you. We say thank you that when in the garden you prayed to take this cup from me, but not your will, but thine be done. And that, Father, you loved us so much and you wanted to fulfill the will of God that you went to the cross for us and again suffered so intently. So, Father, help us in all our infirmities, help us in all our weaknesses, help us in all our, our problems because you understand you are human yet divine. And, Father, you understand our weaknesses, you understand our struggles, and we celebrate that around this table this morning. So, God, we thank you, and we know that you are with us and that you do understand, and we can come to you. We can come to you as our merciful and faithful high priest. 
So, Father, in this emblem, as we take part, we pray your blessing upon it. And Father, help us to remember in this emblem what stands behind it and why we do it. In Jesus' name, amen. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you, the Apostle Paul says, The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let us eat with thanksgiving. We also have the cup here, the cup representing the shed blood of Jesus Christ, which represents the terminology, the shed blood of Jesus Christ uh, points to the giving of a life, to a sacrifice, what we term theologically atonement, Jesus paying the price, atoning for our sins by his death on the cross. And so we give thanks this morning that we have one that loved us so much that he took our place. It should have been us there, but he took our place willingly, lovingly, because because he loves us. And we thank you this morning, Lord Jesus. We thank you. So let's pray. Father, we thank you for sending your son. We thank you for him dying in our place, taking our sin upon upon him, upon his body. And we thank you, Father, that it is finished. The work is done. Jesus said, come to me, all you that are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. We don't have to work for our salvation. We don't have to strive for our salvation. We just need to trust because the work's been done. The work has been done. So, Father, we say thank you. We say thank you for this cup which represents Jesus dying on the cross for our sins and giving us new life, living in that resurrected life. Father, we say thank you. So, Father, be with us now as we celebrate through this cup, your son's precious death. In his name, we pray. Amen. The same way after supper, he took the cup saying, this cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Let us drink with thanksgiving. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you and I proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And he is coming. Hallelujah. God bless you, folks. Have a really great week. And remember, you can come back on, and look at this uh, this message over again, maybe one or two or I don't know, whatever. See what you can get out of it more. But it's a time where we can gather together and worship and learn together. And I just thank the Lord that he's provided this website for us as a church, that we can go through this pandemic at this time uh, th- through this festival. So God bless you folks. Take care. Remember, God loves you and stay in that love of Jesus. God bless you and have a great week. See you next week, the Lord willing. Amen.